industries and how you learn from examples that have been set by uh, other nations, because we're going to have a discussion uh, in a, a, a moment or two about India's place in the world and how the rest of the world sees uh, India. And just <coughs> to remind you, at the end of the day uh, today, our big uh, conclusion uh, to this event is a discussion on uh, what's been uh, termed the irony of India, where we will have two seasoned and respected thinkers who will consider what the future holds for uh, India in the future. We will hear from the National General Secretary of the BJP, uh, but also from uh, Sir Mark Tully, a name that many of you will recognize, of course, a seasoned um, former correspondent for the BBC, former head of the uh, Delhi Bureau uh, for the corporation, still regarded as a distinguished and revered correspondent. It'll be interesting to get his perspective on uh, as someone who has reported on India for so long on what he thinks modern India becomes in the future. So let's uh, talk uh, a little bit now about uh, India's place at the top table of world diplomacy. How does the rest of the world see India? How should India shape that perspective? We have a wide-ranging and captivating exchange delving into US India relations. To introduce that exchange, please join me in welcoming Lord Gaudia. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to one of the most uh, eagerly anticipated uh, sessions of this conclave, a dialogue with uh, General David Petraeus about uh, India's place in the world. Uh, I frankly can't think of a uh, better person to have this uh, conversation uh, with. General Petraeus's reputation precedes him. He has a distinguished record uh, spanning almost four decades in the U.S. Uh, military, including commanding forces in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and going on to serve as um, director of the CIA in President Obama's administration. Uh, he's highly respected uh, across the aisle as someone uh, who is not just bipartisan, but non-partisan, partisan, and now serves as chair of uh, the KKR Global Institute, advising one of the world's largest uh, alternative asset managers on geopolitical developments and cross-cutting sector trends. General Petraeus, it's an honor to have you with us. Yeah, fine, thanks. Um, um, is this on? We can, you can hear it. Look, can, it's, uh, it's so great to be back in Buckinghamshire. Um, I've been out here before and uh, delighted to have an excuse to return. Uh, very kind of you all to invite me here. Uh, this is frankly a reflection of the importance that KKR puts on India as well as the importance that I put on it personally. Um, Sanjay Nair, our CEO for uh, India, has built a franchise out there basically that is extraordinary. I just checked with him before the, our session, and I think we're up to $12 billion and counting in terms of investments, not just in private equity, but also now in real estate uh, and also in a variety of different credit and capital markets uh, endeavors. And I believe that we are the largest investor of our type in India, uh, and we see it as an area of extraordinary opportunity and growth for the future. It's terrific. Perhaps, um, you know, Patrice, if I could set the scene for our conversation, this uh, conclave in our session today uh, could not be more timely uh, with the recent re-election of Prime Minister Modi's government for a second term and the much acclaimed uh, appointment of Dr. Subramaniam J. Shankar as India's new uh, Minister for External Affairs. Uh, many have welcomed this appointment uh, as signaling a further shift up in gear uh, for India's global diplomatic efforts. Uh, Jay Shankar is someone uh, you know well. 
Very well. Yeah. Uh, and he yeah. uh, addressed this summit uh, yesterday mm -hmm. by live uh, video link. Um, Dr. Jake Shankar has uh, served as India's ambassador in both Washington, where you uh, had uh, close contact with him, mm -hmm. and also in Beijing. Uh, and indeed, uh, you spoke together on a panel at the beginning of this year in New Delhi during the Raizina dialogue. And during that discussion, um, you suggested that India has to decide, has to take a side in the new world order with a uh, rising uh, China and resurgent Russia. Dr. Jay Shankar retorted that India must indeed take a side, its own one. And um, so let me begin by uh, asking you about how do you uh, perceive India in view of uh, recent events, both um, politically and economically? And, and how do you see that position evolving during Prime Minister Modi's second term? Sure. Look, first of all, I have enormous respect for Dr. Jai Shankar. Um, indeed, we were on stage while he was enjoying his private sector experience at that time. Uh, as all of us who have been in government have found, I've often noted that I have come to realize that the greatest calling in life beyond government service is the private equity industry. Uh, and he was... <laughs> <laughs> I've got the other uh, way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not a bad path either. Uh, and you had a reasonable level entry job uh, as well. Um, look, and I also knew him, by the way, as foreign secretary. Uh, so there's quite a lengthy relationship that he has had. And he really, the relationship that he had with the U.S. stems back to his time uh, when he was in the Foreign Office. Uh, and I think in the late 80s, certainly in the 90s, was played a big role in a number of the agreements that we had as the U.S.-India relationship evolved since, say, the Clinton administration, quite strongly through the Bush administration, continued with Obama and indeed into the current administration as well. Uh, and this has particularly blossomed uh, on the defense side, uh, where, of course, we had under Secretary Mattis, my old shipmate from the past in uniform, uh, the change of the name of U.S. Pacific Command to Indo-Pacific Command. This is not just uh, you know, a change of a title. Uh, this is not just symbolic. This is highly substantive, and we saw one agreement after another on logistics, on communications, and so forth. These seem very arcane and very technical, and actually they are, except that they're also very, very substantive and they have a great deal of meaning. Um, at the same time, you see India evolving from a period where you know, it was the leader of the non-aligned movement, uh, still to a degree a proud member of the BRICS, um, and my reference at that time on stage at the Ricina Dialogue was to, in a sense, gently nudge with great respect uh, India to realize that, well, certainly it's going to be India first. Uh, and of course, it was one of your peer uh, predecessors many, a couple of centuries ago, Palmerston, mm -hmm. Lord Palmerston, who famously said, uh, England has no permanent allies, it only has permanent interests. But the truth is, I think that India's interests are evolving. Uh, and they are evolving beyond the, again, non-aligned movement or the BRICS. I mean, is it the BRICS with which India wants to be associated in the future, the largest democracy in the world that's just held the largest democratic election uh, uh, ever in the world, is poised to surpass China in population? Uh, and I hoped that the second uh, term for Prime Minister Modi really is the Modi moment mm -hmm. that many of us had expected might transpire during the first uh, term in office. Uh, without attribution, I'll mention that someone who is now quite close to Prime Minister Modi called me up one time. This is, I'd left government, he was still in it, and asked if we could meet for lunch in Washington and was interested in books on second term presidencies. <laughs> now what I took from that, this is early in the first term of Prime Minister Modi's, uh, uh, and what I realized from that, there was quite an insight that, you know, Prime Minister Modi has found that running India is not quite so easy as running Gujarat. 
um, and you don't have quite the absolute power. Uh, and indeed, at that time, he didn't have the control of the parliament that he has now. I mean, this is quite a remarkable electoral result. Uh, the truth is that many people, I think, were giving a, a shot at the opposition of actually taking him down. Uh, and in fact, he had a resounding victory, and he now enjoys a much greater uh, majority in the lower house, and presumably, and I guess it's a couple of years, we'll probably follow that with the upper house. So I think he has the opportunity now to move past the reforms that he did in his first term, some of which, frankly, took a lot longer than we expected. GST, we thought was a gimme. This is like, you know, a two-foot putt, and it turned out to take, I don't know how many years in the end, three and a half years or so, and then it had to be, there were a lot of little issues that had to be, it made it less than the kind of complete deal that a lot of us had hoped for. Uh, the bankruptcy law finally was done. Again, something we thought could be done earlier. Uh, demonetization has spurred the digital economy, certainly, but there are obviously some uneven results of that, and the, if you will, the spontaneity with which that was pursued uh, was a bit surprising as well. So the question is, at a time when now, unfortunately, there's trade friction with the United States, and you see a calling into question of the trade status, is it major non-NATO trades, this kind of issue is emerging, and with a U.S. president who focuses a great deal on trade deficits, and although that deficit has indeed gone down, reassuringly, it is still fairly substantial. It's nothing like the deficit with China or some other countries. Um, but we do see these kinds of issues popping up Reassured, I think, by the very recent visit, just in recent days, by Secretary Pompeo uh, to India, uh, where he was able to meet, of course, with the new Minister of Foreign Affairs. And I think we look forward to the uh, G20 summit at Osaka, where President uh, Trump has now arrived, and what will be a very important bilateral meeting, I think, to determining uh, the way forward, or the direction, at least, the trajectory, I think, of a second-term uh, Modi government uh, and a, a president who will be around for at least another 18 months uh, at the very least. So l l let me probe a little bit further uh, into your exchanges with um, Dr. Jay Shankar in uh, Delhi. Um, your, your premise uh, was about taking sides in the context of a, a new Cold War with uh, between US and, and China, and you mentioned Mike Pompeo. I had um, the pleasure of uh, meeting with him in London uh, last month, and, and um, he was very open in discussing that topic. Uh, and of course, uh, he has been in Delhi this week, as, um, as you mentioned. Do you believe that that issue, that US-China um, Axis Cold War, as it's being called, the new Cold War, as, as it's being called, is the defining issue of our time, which literally influences everything else. And if, if you do believe that, how does India adjust to that new reality? Well, look, I think the, there's no question that the defining issue of our time is the rise of China and then the U.S.-China relationship, yeah. which is far and away the most important in the world. Uh, how that evolves does a great deal to sketch out or to define the geostrategic future uh, in which India is going to play an increasing part. Um, India has, actually Prime Minister Modi, has forged, I think, a very interesting and constructive relationship uh, with his counterpart uh, in China, despite the Doklam mm -hmm. uh, dispute mm -hmm. where I thought India, he played that masterfully. Uh, my view has been for a number of years when people have asked, so what do we do about China? Well, and my response is we've got to get the big ideas right first. The biggest of the big ideas is that we should be firm but not provocative. And frankly, I think that we have not been sufficiently firm. And it's not just the United States. It's a number of other countries as well. So as India does forge this identity, uh, as it determines how much, you know, a foot is still in the non-aligned movement, the BRICS, uh, and that of the Western democracies of the world at a time of a rising China, which with the Belt and Road uh, mm -hmm. Initiative is somewhat threatening, somewhat trying to bypass China or, uh, India. 
And let's not forget the so-called string of pearls with the port of Gwadar, uh, other ports, uh, what happened in, in, um, in, in the island to the south of India, uh, of course, where China built a port that wasn't needed, an airport that hasn't been used, a highway that's been used for drying rice. Uh, and when uh, the country couldn't pay for it, they said, no problem, we'll just take rights to it for the next 99 years. I mean, this is neo-colonial kind of financing. So that is the environment, uh, again, in which the new chapter of the Modi moment is going to be written. Uh, and how India goes about this, I think, will be crucially important, again, not just to India in the region, but also uh, to the world. And I think India does have to make some choices, though. I, by the way, don't use, and I don't think I used uh, at the Ricina Dialogue, the world cold, the term Cold War. I don't, I think that would be premature. I don't think it's impossible that you could see this evolve that way. But let's keep in mind, by the way, that for the U.S., the com competition with China is very different from the competition with the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact uh, during the Cold War. Uh, we are not just China's biggest strategic competitor and vice versa. We're also each other's biggest trading partners. And that was certainly not the case, uh, again, with the Soviet Union, with whom we did minimal trade, if anything, occasionally some excess wheat sales to get it off the hands of the farmers in the US. Uh, this is a very different uh, relationship in that regard. Um, and again, I think India does have to choose what is the backbone of the 5G. Uh, are concerns about Huawei legitimate uh, or not? Can you put a layer on top of the core that protects it? All these are, and these are seemingly technical issues. Uh, and you and I were talking about how GCHQ here has evaluated Huawei and found its engineering to be quite shoddy, as is as another independent US firm uh, more recently. Um, what about the S-400 sale? Why is India so intent uh, on buying a weapon system uh, from a country that is frustrating the world, uh, threatening its neighbors, invaded two of them, uh, again, trying to scare others and, and involved in our election and to an extent that was absolutely reprehensible. Uh, all of this, uh, why reward a country like that by buying its air defense system, which almost immediately then prompts, requires, the imposition of sanctions on India under the CATSA, this countering adversaries uh, trade issue, uh, unless we have some kind of national security carve out, which is not assured. Why even present the US with that kind of issue? Now I got it, India again has its own identity, its own image, Jai Shankar will say India first and rightfully so, uh, but why risk what I would contend is the most important, or at least among the most important relationships that India has uh, at, by that kind of uh, purchase at a time when all of the other uh, indices of partnership were growing and at a time where you know you have the Quad, uh, the, mm -hmm. the US, Japan, Australia, and India, how significant that is. Uh, you see the maritime exercises that have been taking place there was even an exercise three years ago which featured none other than the infantry company commanded by Captain Stephen Petraeus, um, who <laughs> we're very proud of, needless to say, although he's now <coughs> out of service and doing a JD MBA at Harvard, which we're also proud of. But, but again, <coughs> um, all of this has been blossoming, and why jeopardize that mm -hmm. um, with an air defense purchase uh, of that type? when you could strengthen the relationship with the, with the Western world. Well, we, interestingly, we had a, 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 a private um, dinner uh, at the beginning of this uh, conference, uh, uh, and actually the whole subject of India First came up as a, a topic of, uh, uh, of discussion. I think that Vijay Chotaiwala, who's in the audience, who heads the, the BJP's uh, international relations uh, division, was, was in the room. And um, the distinction was made that India first, as India would describe it, is not the same as America first as President well, Trump would <laughs> describe yeah, it, i.e. It, it, it's, it's got a, 
it, it's, it's more from the long tradition of um, non-alignment that, that India came from post-independence. I'm not, part of me thinks, I'm not sure how that argument survives the, 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 the presidential Twitter feed because <laughs> well, that's more are you for us or against us. But m maybe if I can ask you about India first in the context of the long historical ties between both Russia and Iran, and you, you referred to that. Um, and the Iran topic is obviously highly, um, you know, highly pertinent, and you, you've actually been um, very perceptive in anticipating the current escalating tensions with Iran. Um, I'd be very curious to know whether you think President Trump has an exit strategy from that situation, no doubt it'll dominate the G20 discussions in I Osaka. And, and could India act as a, you know, if Jay Shankar was there, he could say, look, the advantages of us being non-aligned and having a relationship with, Russia, with Iran, maybe in Russia, is that we can act as a intermediary, maybe as an honest broker alongside Japan. I, I would not dismiss that likelihood, but at the end of the day, I'm less concerned about who brokers the, you know, it could be Oman, it could be Switzerland. Uh, we've actually, we've reached out through Oman reportedly. According to the New York Times, uh, Iran has reached out through Switzerland and said we don't want war. Uh, again, if it's Japan, although I thought it was a bit uh, unseemly uh, for Japan's prime minister to be meeting with the leader of Iran at the same time, you know, the visible state, at the same time the Iranian deep state, presumably the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps Navy, is carrying out an attack against a Japanese flagged ship. By the way, nothing showed more the reality that we often forget that Iran actually has two different states. Yes, they're both overseen by the supreme leader, but there is a visible state with an elected president. Um, certainly from a list that is approved uh, by a council, elected parliament, ministers, and army, navy, air force. Uh, but then there's the deep state, which actually controls the policy for Iran that matters most to a lot of us. It, this is, the, the, again, the Revolutionary Guards Corps with its army, navy, and air force. Uh, the Quds Force of the Revolutionary Guards Corps, which is a cross between the CIA and special operations and has caused you know, they were responsible for over 600 deaths of our soldiers with the weaponry, the explosively formed penetrators they provided to the Shia militia in Iraq uh, during my time in command there. Uh, and then at Central Command as well. And then you have these basically pipe swingers on the streets as required, the besieged militia who can be activated if there's any kind of disturbance uh, and can be counted on to clear the streets as they did say in Tehran during the, I guess it was the Green movement uh, some years back. Um, so you have this, again, visible state, that's who meets with the Prime Minister of Japan, the deep state, which actually controls the policy, as the commander of the Quds Force sent to me in a message through the Iraqi president in the middle of the Battle of Basra in March and April of 2008, and the message said, General Petraeus, you should know that I, Qasem Soleimani, control the policy for Iran when it comes to Iraq and also Syria, Lebanon, Gaza, and Afghanistan. And by the way, since then would add Yemen and probably the Gulf states as well. Uh, the point was, don't screw around with those diplomats. Don't deal with them. You deal with, with me. Um, and that, that was obviously not something we were going to pursue. And my message to him in return was essentially pound sand, but, or words to that effect. Um, but. At the end of the day, this comes down to resume, re resumption of negotiations between Iran and the U.S. But more importantly, if I could, I think that we have to acknowledge that there is not at present complete clarity on what the United States wants to achieve with respect to Iran's nuclear program. That, actually, that is clear. They cannot have a nuclear weapon. That is what the president has made very clear. He's also made clear we don't want war with Iran. But what is it that we want with respect to the missile program and to their support for Shia militia, the so-called malign activity, which is not just so-called, it is malign activity, where they're seeking to Lebanonize Iraq and Syria 
and maybe Yemen, but certainly the first two, in the same way that they have Lebanonized Lebanon. In other words, you have a very powerful militia muscle on the street, Hezbollah, and it then gets power in the parliament to the point that it has in Lebanon a blocking veto with its coalition, uh, which includes more than just Hezbollah. Uh, they'd love to achieve the same thing in Iraq, where they do fund, train, equip, and direct to some degree uh, quite powerful Shia militia. Uh, the question is, again, what does the U.S. want to achieve? If I were the Central Command commander still, my question for Washington would be to give me greater clarity. Perhaps he has it, but it is not necessarily apparent. Um, or is there sort of a tug of war between, say, the National Security Advisor and some other elements uh, one way or the other? Uh, to see if this could blossom into regime change, something that most of us don't think is, is reasonably attainable and has some questions of its own, as we have seen when uh, strongmen, however reprehensible, uh, are toppled in that particular region. So again, regardless of who the interlocutor is to get this going, at the end of the day, it's going to be the U.S. and Iran, ideally with again, a multilateral group, because you do want help from Russia and China, even if it's, yeah. e if it's just not uh, unhelpful, uh, just even just set aside and let us. But I think there's a path to something that could be the extension of the existing nuclear agreement, which had a number of positive features, as you well know. All the medium enriched, 20 percent rich uranium gone, 99 percent of the low enriched uranium gone, intrusive inspections, the plutonium path to a bomb ended, but there was a very significant shortcoming in that, and that is that it had end dates, and those end dates were starting to approach. It started at 10 years, uh, and then it, it continued progressively. So can you get something that extends longer, uh, and then can we come to some kind of agreement on some ramifications, some limitations on the missile program, which is becoming increasingly threatening to the countries in, in the Gulf region, uh, and also uh, about their malign activity, again, their support for Shia militia who are undermining the governmental uh, capabilities, in particular uh, in Iraq, uh, a country that has been through a great deal, but right now, in my view, has the best president, prime minister, and speaker combination, that is Kurd, Shia, and Sunni, uh, that, w that anyone could have possibly hoped for. By the way, they are also Iraq first, uh, they have, they do, look, this is okay. I understood, look, I, I'm an Iraqi, I'm an Iraqi. I mean, I spent four years in those tents. Um, I f was applying for a ration card or, you know, I might vote there even if I don't vote in the United States. Um, but they have to have a, a relationship with Iran. That is something that yeah. we can't deny. It's hugely important to them. And Iran is always going to be three or four times larger in, uh, in land mass three times larger in population, at least, than Iraq was when we invaded it. Uh, and th but they don't want to be, as we say, the 51st state of Iran. They don't want to be a part of uh, the country. They just want to have a relationship, just as they very much want to have a relationship with the United States. And by the way, now, quite skillfully, I think, uh, with their Sunni Arab neighbors as well. Um, By the way, if I could come back to yeah. something else that has been quite significant in the U.S.-India relationship, because I jotted a couple of notes earlier. Um, I mentioned the Quad. I mentioned these other defense agreements. But there's two others that are very, very important, I think, to India. One was the designation of the leader of jaish e Mohammed as a terrorist right. by the United States. Not trivial. This is a big <coughs> deal. Uh, and the other is pursuing financial action task force demands on Pakistan. Uh, again, s these are actions that were sort of resisted previously because of some effort to try to have an agreement with Pakistan that would facilitate a peace uh, in Afghanistan that we might talk about later on, yeah. but something for which I, I fervently hope but think is probably unlikely. Well, you mentioned, um, and I was actually going to come on to um, <coughs> both the China and, 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 and Pakistan <coughs> dimension, so why don't we... We, we do that. So um, uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, Prime Minister Modi and, and the National Security Advisor uh, Ajit Doval actually invested considerable time and effort before uh, the last general election in the relationship yes. with China and now yep. obviously 
yep. um, benefits from Jay Shankar's four and a half years in, 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 in Beijing. And he's a Mandarin speaker. Yes, absolutely. I mean, he's quite a renaissance man. Yeah. I forget how many languages. I was looking at it earlier. I think it's yeah. at least six or seven languages that he speaks. Yeah. Uh, so quite extraordinary yeah. in that regard as well. And, and after the terrorist attack in, in Pawama, you, you quite rightly pointed out that China didn't immediately help prescribe the leader of Jaishi Muhammad, uh, Masood Azhar, yes. but it eventually dropped its yep. uh, objection. Yep. And By I, and the way, Jay Shankar is also, I think, the deputy chief of mission in Japan. Right. So, I mean, you talk about sent from central casting to be the minister of foreign affairs. It's really quite, a, quite an extraordinary preparation. Yep. And on the, and you mentioned this previously, but on the economic front, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, remained a source of considerable anxiety in Delhi and, you know, all the BRI projects that encircle India. In your view, how, how does, um, and to use a sort of colorful metaphor, how does the Indian tiger learn to coexist with the Chinese dragon? Well, again, it always helps, I think, to get the big ideas right, if you will. And I alluded to this earlier, uh, actually from a US perspective, I think it is to, that the tiger has to be very firm with the dragon, but not provocative. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I thought this was masterfully uh, demonstrated, again, in the Doklam crisis. Um, very, very interesting to see how that played out. Because it was the firmness that ultimately, I think, led to an assessment by the other side that this is just not worth pursuing, even though the tactical advantage at that location was very considerable uh, for China. Uh, and so, again, I think exemplary of what actually the U.S. should have done in some earlier circumstances uh, and still should uh, use as a guiding principle as we go forward with our relationship, by the way, not just with China, but also with Russia, frankly, also with Iran, and, and arguably also with North Korea, which are the four leading revisionist uh, countries of the world. That is, they're not satisfied with the status quo. They want to revise it, some of it in a somewhat revolutionary way, and China in a more evolutionary way, but in some cases uh, with some goals that are seen seemingly less legitimate, I guess you would say, uh, than some of the others. So apart from uh, the relationship with China, uh, one of the central defining issues for India in its neighborhood, of course, is the relationship with Pakistan. Uh, following the 2014 general election, there was an attempt by Prime Minister Modi to engage um, with Pakistan. Those efforts were not uh, reciprocated, quite the opposite, uh, being sabotaged by um, subsequent terrorist incidents. And so India's strategy seems to have shifted to effectively ignoring, isolating uh, Pakistan as far as possible. Is that the right interpretation and is, is that the right strategy? Well, as one who worked very, very hard uh, in several different assignments, um, probably dating back to when I was uh, the, essentially the internal chief of staff for a chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, then later, certainly as U.S. Central Command, which includes Pakistan, but not India, uh, in its area of responsibility, and, and obviously Afghanistan, all the Central Asian states in the Middle East. Um, and then as CIA director, uh, and in the latter two in particular, worked very, very hard to build a relationship with what are arguably the two key leaders of Pakistan, uh, those being the Chief of Army Staff and the Director of ISI, the Inter Services Intelligence. Not to say that I ignored the President or Prime Minister, depending on who was uh, up at the various time, you know. Well, versus, Hamid bin Salman did. Uh, <laughs> um, so, and had our hopes dashed. Um, I forget who it was that used to describe Pakistan as our favorite frenemy, um, that it was a friend <laughs> whom we were trying to help. I mean, when, when, when Pakistan pursued what was a very impressive campaign 
against the Tariki Taliban Pakistani, so the Pakistani version of the Taliban who are focused internal to Pakistan rather than the Afghan Taliban who are headquartered on Pakistani soil but focused uh, into Afghanistan. Um, and you may recall that TTP was, it was as if they were pointing a dagger uh, from Swat Valley. They'd taken over much of the, what then used to be known as the Northwest Frontier Province, uh, and were pointed right at Islamabad. Uh, and uh, the Chief of Army Staff, General Kiani at the time, again, pr oversaw a very, very impressive uh, essentially counterinsurgency campaign right out of the textbook. In fact, we, he read the textbook. You know, we'd written it back in 2006 in the U.S. and then practiced it in Iraq. Uh, and we were helping with that much more than people realize. I mean, we had special <coughs> operations forces embedded all the way down to their brigade forward command posts, uh, so their tactical command posts, so right behind a battalion headquarters, which is pretty far forward in that particular uh, structure, and providing a variety of different forms of assistance. Again, no direct assistance, but you know, when they were running out of ammunition, we had an emergency airlift of 105 and 155 millimeter howitzers. We rushed a variety of other uh, capacity uh, building uh, instruments in there, helped to rebuild their uh, counterterrorism uh, force, their special operations forces, literally built their entire compound, uh, counterinsurgency training center, all the rest of this. Um, and again, felt that there was a tremendous partnership uh, during this period and watched with admiration in 2009 as this was carried out from the early part of the year uh, to the latter part. And they basically retook SWAT, Baijur, Momon, Khyber, Oryxai, uh, South Waziristan, part of it, the Waziri tribal area, and then unfortunately sort of ran out of momentum and culminated, as you say, in a military sense, short of of North Waziristan, which is in many respects the heart of darkness, the home to uh, the Haqqani network, which does so much damage to Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda, which continues to try to reestablish the sanctuary there. Uh, now the Islamic State, uh, the Islamic movement in Uzbekistan, and of course, again, the Tariki Taliban Pakistani uh, as well. And again, yes, they took very heavy casualties and the rest of this, um, but gosh, again, and then really it, it, we didn't see that manifest itself again. Uh, and the fact that it, well, well known uh, in the intelligence world, roughly where the different headquarters are and the leaders and so forth, uh, and yet restricted from doing much about that. You can imagine the frustration of being the commander in Afghanistan, another place where I had a very close route, because that continued from Central Command. Even before I took command of Central Command, I was flown out to an aircraft carrier uh, off the southern coast of Pakistan to meet with General Kiani together with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Special Operations Commander of the United States in advance of becoming the Central Command Commander. And that built all the way through that time, uh, Admiral Mullen, a spectacular Chairman of the Joint Chiefs during the bulk of that period, worked very hard to build that relationship. And then also, uh, frankly, with the Director of ISI, who then when I became the CIA Director, I mean, I flew halfway around the world one time, literally to meet with him for two hours, only to get back on the plane and fly back home. It was that important a relationship to us. And yet, at the end of the day, there was a frustrating element to it because the kind of cooperation for which we hoped just ultimately didn't fully materialize. Hence, again, the description by, again, I forget who it was that coined that phrase, but, but that of a, a frenemy. Um, and that has been the story of this. The challenge for Pakistan is that, in my view, it is never truly accepted that the existential threat to the country is not India. It is actually the internal extremists that are eating away at the elements of society and civic life and doing so much damage in so many different respects and are gradually uh, propagating more extremism the education system is sadly is, is degraded somewhat. Parents end up sending their kids to madrasas instead of the public schools. Um, and this is a very, very dangerous downward spiral, uh, which when you then combine the distortions to the economy because of a variety uh, of, <coughs> of different manners in which there are subsidies provided for refined everything, I mean, even sugar, and how you unwind 
those kinds of distortions without a million man march on your doorstep in the morning, frankly, I think defies uh, explanation. And we've had very high hopes as a succession of civilian leaders uh, have taken office um, and hoped that they could actually deal with this. And yet uh, we have not seen that materialize. Sadly, because again, I want to see, there's a lot of admirable qualities uh, in Pakistan, and I learned these from a very early time when I was, of all things, I was the chief of operations in Haiti for the United Nations force, not the U.S. force, and we had a very impressive Pakistani contingent that was the second largest to the U.S. Uh, in there. So again, there's a degree of professionalism and expertise and everything else of discipline and tradition, some of which, of course, obviously very much shared with India that dates all the way back uh, to the days of the, the English Empire. Um, but um, it just has always sort of come up short. And that is tragic because if they can't deal with that internal challenge, um, then it is going to be continuing frustration for India as well, obviously. Let me pivot to the theme of this conference, which is um, India, UK. Uh, it's a complex relationship, the colonial history yep. uh, brings familiarity, a big diaspora, over one and a half million strong. But we've also inherited significant baggage. Um, and sometimes the UK feels that despite the, you know, the shared language, the common legal and institutional frameworks, we haven't made the breakthrough uh, we deserve. And that was certainly the conclusion of a report issued yeah. at the start of this week yeah. by the Foreign Affairs uh, select committee as an objective outsider. How can the UK improve its courtship of India? Let me be very careful here because obviously we are in the UK uh, and and talking to an audience that is focused on uh, relationships with India, uh, whether from the UK or the US or what have you. By the way, I forgot earlier to mention as well that thanks to Sanjay's encouragement, I am a member of the board of the U.S. Strategic, uh, U yeah, and what does that stand for again? The U.S. India Strategic Partnership. Uh, yeah, so, um, so again, I'm a tiny bit hesitant here, and I hope this won't be taken wrong, but it seems to me that what has to happen here uh, is that the country from which India traces many of its you know, its origins, it, it, don't want to overstate that, but certainly its language, its the bureaucratic history, the training of civil servants, all of these that are very, very admirable uh, elements, as does my country, uh, despite revolting uh, back in 1776. But that there has to be, there's, got to move beyond that, I don't know if it's nostalgia or hangover from the jewel in the crown era. I mean, not to put it too bluntly. And, and again, please don't take that wrong, but look, we have had to get, UK's had to get past that with the US. I mean, I get tired of being reminded about, you know, uh, the happy state of affairs before 1776. <laughs> Um, and how much we owe to the, you know, <laughs> to the mothership and all the rest of this. Uh, but the fact is that India is now poised to be the largest country in the world. It is already the largest democracy in the world. It is potentially poised for this breakout economic moment uh, where Prime Minister Modi, emboldened by a success uh, in, the, in his re-election, has, as I mentioned earlier, a greater majority than ever in the parliament a real majority in the parliament now, presumably can pursue the reforms that can propel India forward uh, and make it, in a sense, you know, the next China or the next big thing. Um, and to bring India together, of course, as a country as well, a famously fractious assemblage of states. Um, I mean, people forget that the GST was was akin to making India into the European Union. I mean, this is now a common market, it, internal to the country. Um, and so if this can all now culminate in uh, a real expansion of the economy, 
in ways that so many of us have hoped for, and by the way, in which we have been very, very heavily invested. Um, you know, India doesn't truly yet have a full-fledged banking uh, uh, institution or industry. You know, that's what KKR is there trying to help provide, as, as are uh, a number of other uh, large in investment companies. So, you know, Prime Minister Modi is very open to this, by the way. When Henry Kravis and I first met him right after he was elected in New York, he came and it was, we called it speed dating. It was sort of a revolving door, you know. It, KKR is going in this way, and Blackstone was going out that way, and, you know, <laughs> and GE was right behind us, and I think we each got 20 minutes or something like that. But he actually asked us, he said, I'd like to know what you'd like to see us do to make India more attractive. Gosh, don't ask Petraeus and Kravis that kind of question, because you'll get an answer, and we did. And we sat down again with Sanjay and the team, and, and then our legal experts and all the others, and I forget how many items we listed, but we said, you really want to make India attractive to investment? Here's what you need to do. By the way, he certainly has ticked off some of those, but by no means all of them. Um, and I think that, you know, that's, that's the question. Now, again, back to the India-UK relationship. Obviously, there is an extraordinary, extraordinarily strong relationship there. Um, and, but it does have to evolve, as I said. And it does have to get beyond what it was uh, to what it should be. Uh, at a time that is very pivotal for the UK with, uh, I mean, I don't need to tell you, you're the one in government, but uh, if you can lead us out of this wilderness that has been called Brexit for three years, <laughs> uh, this is trying to get to the promised land or something like that. And um, again, when that is done, when it is behind the UK, uh, then can that relationship remain strong, uh, but be one you know, that is very much uh, of equals. One is much more equal than the other when it comes to population, demographics, and opportunity, frankly, while noting that the UK is still going to be the fifth largest or so economy in the world and still very much uh, a force uh, to be reckoned with. So you tempted me. Let, let's go to the B word. Um, and you're quite right, UK politics is uh, all consumed by the, the seemingly <coughs> intractable issue and ag again, as, a, an outside, as an outsider, and it's been very refreshing to, to, to you know, hear that, that, you know, the honest external uh, perspective. Do you think that the EU is overplaying its hand or is the UK mishandling the negotiations? And what, you know, you, you, you're one of your philosophies is always have the big idea at the start of any thing that you're leading from a strategic perspective. So what, what big idea would you suggest that the new British Prime Minister brings to the table to unlock this situation? Well, look, uh, the challenge for the next Prime Minister, whether it's Boris or Jeremy or whomever it is, uh, is going to be that I don't think the numbers in Parliament change. Uh, the fact that you have a new prime minister doesn't change the reality with which you deal on the ground. I mean, I remember going into Iraq for the beginning of the surge, and everybody said, oh, great, it's all going to be turned around. And, you know, three months later, my boss came in and put his arm around me and said, you know, you've got a public relations problem. I said, boss, we don't have a public relations problem. We have a results problem. <laughs> and, when, and, when the, and when the results are better, the public relations problem, by the way, goes away. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm not going to put lipstick on a pig. It's still <laughs> ugly. Um, this is the problem here. The, re the, the realities are extraordinarily challenging. And again, I'm telling someone who is in government, albeit in the other chamber, than the one that is really going to define this. But getting to whatever the exit strategy is, uh, and from my perspective, one that uh, allows the continued commerce, that allows the continued sharing of intelligence. I mean, the ramifications of this are way, way beyond what people are focused on. Uh, there's all kinds of little eaches here. The Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of Europe is always a UK four-star. By the way, he's dual-hatted as the head of the European Union force, and that was to reassure the Americans uh, that the EU force wouldn't go off on its own, uh, that would have the trusty, reliable, special relationship partner uh, at the head of that. What happens to that now when there are countries in the EU that would like to see that? 
And by the way, Pete, I'm often asked about the European defense identity and all this stuff, and I said, look, don't tell me about new headquarters. Tell me about new battalions or new brigades. And if you're gonna actually build some new brigades and battalions, I'll be impressed. But if it's just one more headquarters, then I'm a, a, good, a good bit less so. Um, but how does, how do all these relationships, again, there are relationships sharing of information. Flight manifests, for example, that are massively important. Can, can there be a sharing of that if the UK is no longer part, uh, again, of the economic component of the European Union, which is what this is largely founded upon? Um, so does a new prime minister, can a new prime minister actually bring together enough votes to determine the path out of uh, the EU and do that in a way that is least damaging uh, to the UK? Because look, I am also, a, 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 for, a, still am a professor, uh, but someone who taught economics and international relations at several different places over the years, because I've had this strange <coughs> soldier and sort of academic background. Um, and I've seen no economic analyses that talk about a positive effect to GDP or uh, some of the other indices on which you would focus. Um, so how can this be navigated uh, in the least damaging way? Uh, and then that new identity and global Britain and all the other stuff with the Britons, the UK still in the UN Security Council but no longer the counterbalance, say, to France with Germany at the, the head, if you will, and the EU, all these other dynamics, um, how can that be negotiated? And I think there are serious questions about that still. And you know, having spent yesterday in London in different venues that included a number of different members of parliament, um, it's not clear to me that the facts on the ground are any different after, uh, say, Prime Minister Boris Johnson takes office than they were uh, the day before he took over. And that's a real challenge for the UK, needless to say. And there's a lot hanging on that. Well, look, I'm conscious that we're eating into lunch, but Manoj, can we have a little bit more uh, time? I've got a couple of, couple of questions. We're, we, we're captivating the audience. I'm getting, I'm getting a claim. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the, do, 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 still, still do the questioning. But uh, let me, um, let me, uh, there's, there's t t two areas I want to touch on because I think these, the audience will enjoy this, I think. So we've got we've to talk about the US elections. So uh, coming up next year, uh, President Trump uh, launches re-election campaign in Orlando uh, last week with the slogan, Keep America Great. And we had the first Democratic uh, presidential debate in Miami Yesterday, another one today, there's so many candidates vying for this. <coughs> Frankly, should we be prepared for the inevitability of the second <laughs> Trump term? And for India, because we want to bring this back to India, is that actually counterintuitively a favorable outcome based on the devil you know? First of all, I think that the US-India relationship is so strong at this point in time that you have seen it get stronger and stronger, beginning with the Democratic administration, the latter years of the Clinton administration, throughout eight years of the Republican George W. Bush administration, gathered even more momentum in the Obama, or the Obama administration, and has continued that up until the present now, with the exception of these trade uh, frictions that have emerged that are not trivial. But by and large, I think the importance of the U.S.-India relationship is at a stage where it doesn't matter whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. Um, with either, I think, this will still be a very important component of our foreign policy. But I should note that actually with either, there are challenges within the United States for whomever the next president is when it comes to defining the U.S. role in the world, whether we believe that global trade is good for America or not, uh, whether we believe globalism writ large is good or not, uh, and whether or not we believe the U.S. should continue to lead the rules-based international order, uh, and is that all that it is cracked up to be? Now, I am a big-time internationalist. I am a huge proponent of U.S. leadership in the world. I believe it is a force uh, of good, although not a force that has not made some mistakes over the years. Um, but there, there is a question in the heartland. There is a question, uh, again, 
Uh, and that was ultimately something into which President Trump tapped more effectively than did candidate Clinton, noting that Secretary Clinton, of course, won almost three million more popular votes than did the president, and it's our peculiarity of the Electoral College that allowed him to win uh, by essentially less than 80,000 votes in three swing states, which is likely what the next election will come down to as well. And you literally have to focus on those counties in the swing yeah. states uh, that, are, that really do slide back and forth between the Republican and Democrat, noting that there are some states that are so solidly blue, Democrat, or so solidly red, Republican, uh, that they're going to go with whatever candidate, I think, uh, emerges in either party. I think there are a couple, as always, you know, an, an economist would say, well, it depends. And the result on the election, which is a long way off, I mean, 18 months or so is, a, is an eternity in politics uh, in which almost every week now brings uh, new and startling developments. Um, and in the advent of a communication strategy that is founded on the presidential use of Twitter, um, this is even more so. Uh, and he, you know, he's, proud, I think, to be described as a disruptor in chief. Um, but the question really comes down to what happens to the economy between now and then? Does it remain strong in GDP growth or does it begin to slow? And are there questions about the way that we have achieved this growth, noting that we will be running the largest fiscal deficits uh, in a very, very long time and doing that at a time of historically low unemployment uh, at the end of a, an expansion that is within a few weeks going to be the longest in our history. It'll surpass the one during the bulk of the Clinton administration's period. And then frankly, who is the candidate on the Democratic Party? Uh, does that candidate allow himself or herself, because there are many women running a, a substantial number this time, um, to be defined as a socialist in particular and play into his hand in that regard? Uh, or is this candidate, a bit more of a centrist, because keep in mind that one of the challenges of democracy in America, and a reason that I have described it in a recent speech as disrupted, is the importance of party primaries, and that many of the elections, uh, especially in the House of Representatives, where they've redrawn the districts to give an advantage to one party or the other, uh, they've become, again, bright red or bright blue. The election that matters is not the general election, it's not the Democrat versus Republican, it's the primary. Uh, and keep in mind that the people who vote in the primary are the activists by definition, and that pulls you further left and further right, which has created a loss of the center in the House of Representatives and to a degree uh, in the Senate. So these are sort of the dynamics in which all this is going to play out, um, but without some sense of how much the president can tout the economy, uh, and your 401k, your retirement plans, and this kind of thing, and the qualities, the attributes of the candidate of the other side, um, I think it's very difficult at this point to predict much of anything. Let me end um, by going back to the, the theme of the second day of this conference, which is uh, around global, global investor interest in, in India. Um, you chair KKR's Global Institute and help analyze risks and opportunities. So maybe a sort of two-part um, uh, question to this. Um, firstly, w what do you see as the biggest risks faces, facing investors today, and, and not to lead the witness, but how do you see the issue of, in particular, climate change vis-a-vis -a, -vis a country like India, given the disproportionate impact it could have. And maybe to end on a, a positive note, sure. what are the geopolitical bright spots and global trends which investors should be backing? First of all, I think we face the most complex array of risks, threats, however you want to term them, uh, that we've seen since the end of the Cold War. I mentioned already the four revisionist powers in the world. You have the continued threat of Islamist extremism, which is going to be a generational challenge, not the threat of a decade, much less a few years, and requires a sustained commitment that is sustainable in terms of the commitment, the expenditure of blood and treasure. 
increasing cyber threats that are or ever more diabolically creative. They're s racing ahead so rapidly that we can hardly even keep up with them conceptually, intellectually, much less with legislation, uh, regulation, policies, and organizational architecture and capabilities. Um, we see populism in the democratic world. Um, I think every large democracy um, has felt some degree of populism, maybe with the arguable exception of Japan and maybe Australia. I think you'd have to acknowledge there was a degree of populism in the, the latest uh, election of the prime minister in India. Certainly there is right here with Brexit, with the Yellow Jackets in France, with the left-wing, right-wing government in Italy, a minority government in Spain, uh, Germany, uh, where the chancellor was, had to step down from party leadership, barely held on to the chancellorship, and may or may not last out uh, the year, despite an incredible run of economic importance, uh, low unemployment, a fiscal surplus, and a variety of other very, very positive uh, developments. Um, and the United States, where again, we have, we have seen a degree of disruption uh, and populism uh, as well. Um, you also see, I think, unprecedented strain on the rules-based international order. A lot of that coming from the country that has benefited from that international order more than any other country over the last 40 years because of what China has achieved since Deng Xiaoping welcomed the world to China 40 years ago is unprecedented in the history of mankind. Uh, and yet again, you see these, these strains and stresses uh, on it. And I mentioned as well this questioning in the United States about the right role of the United States in the world, should we continue to lead globalism, global trade, uh, alliances, are they still important, partnerships, and all the rest of that. Again, I think I ask, answer in the affirmative to every one of those, but I have to acknowledge that there is a bit of a discussion that does continue uh, in my own country in that regard. And then you raise climate. Um, and look, having been in Delhi on a bad day um, is a, it approaches a religious experience. I mean, this is not a, uh, it, I think, has outstripped uh, Beijing on a bad day, and that's very, very bad. I've, I've actually gotten sick from, I've gotten so dehydrated that both my colleague and I, you know, had to go see a doctor <coughs> over this stuff. So again, think of the effect on those living that, and so I think the imperative for addressing climate change uh, is enormous. Um, I was one who s did support, again, I'm truly nonpartisan. I can support either party in the US and advise either party, which I do. If they ask, uh, I will provide my thoughts. Um, and that again, that it was very positive to see the US, China, India, and others all leading in Paris. Uh, and that I think we need to continue to do that. This is not going away. Uh, you can't argue this away. You can't, again, argue with the facts however much you may argue whether it's 90 or 95 or 98 percent caused by man uh, actions, humankind actions, uh, and so forth. So again, I think uh, an issue. I mean, what about the positive trends? Well, there are a number of those, actually, and what are the big themes, if you will? Um, certainly, just geographically, we see Southeast Asia, which I'd stretch all the way from South Asia through, again, because we're already in China, we're already in Japan, we're already in India, but we see a lot of opportunity there. And I would include Indonesia, I'd go all the way out to the Philippines uh, and so forth. And we have done numerous investments in each of those areas, in many cases, the first of those in the last year or two. The Philippines, I think we've just done two or so. And frankly, that was after a couple of trips that I made just to come back and give thumbs up and say, yes, there's some headline issues here with the president there who's also quite disruptive and says some things that occasionally raise eyebrows, but which has generally a good uh, financial uh, management, if you will, in the country, and again, business uh, people with whom you can partner. So the context is one uh, that does by no means scares us off and actually is quite attractive. That's tied into demographics, and we look, obviously, where are the countries that are growing? And then beyond that, a very, very important theme for us. Even in countries that aren't growing demographically anymore, China would be at the top of that list. Japan uh, would be near another. But for China and a number of the other developing economies, it's about the rise of the middle class, the growth of the middle class. You know, the middle class in China now 
I believe is more populous than the entire population of the United States. So just think about how many opportunities there are there as a result of that. India won't be far behind. Other countries, again, in Southeast Asia. By the way, sadly, I have not included Africa in this, where we see the governance and rule of law and corruption and other issues being so substantial uh, that despite a very successful investment in Ethiopia four years ago, the largest PE deal in Africa at that time, we have lar we're still considering investments, but we're not aggressively pursuing them the way that we were uh, four or five years ago when we thought that we would, by this point in time, have a, uh, a headquarters in uh, West Africa, probably in Nigeria and East Africa and Ethiopia, and that just hasn't transpired. There's some other uh, challenges like that uh, out there as well. Now, beyond that, the, the phenomenon of the experience economy. You know, you and I don't go to dinner. We go out to have an experience. And those restaurants, those hotels, those tourist attractions that have made this a real experience, a truly memorable occasion, um, are prospering, are growing. And we have invested a great deal behind that theme. And again, I know this is hugely macro, and it sounds very obvious once you've stated it, but not everybody has been acting and not even more have been putting their money behind it, which we have been doing. Deconglomerization, which is a very sort of awkward word, but another great opportunity. Look at what we did with Panasonic Healthcare. Now you have to ask yourself, as we did, why does Panasonic and Electronics Corporation have a healthcare firm within it? And we asked ourselves that question, then we asked Panasonic, how much Value added are you to this thing? Look at what it's done lately, and it hasn't done much. We carved it out, we bought something from Bayer, took it global, hugely successful uh, investment. We've repeated that, I think, at least three or four times just in Japan alone, and we see a lot of opportunities for that uh, in a number of countries around the world. Again, some of those uh, opportunities in India, we think, uh, others further in Japan, in Korea, and other places where you have these very large uh, conglomerations, uh, not all pieces of which uh, fit together uh, perfectly. So again, we see these kinds of opportunities as being very substantial. Look, valuations are at an all-time high in many parts of the world, in many industries, and yet we continue to find uh, very good deals. Um, I was thinking the other day that, you know, when I joined KKR, I think it was six years ago, um, KKR was hugely respected for the $83 billion in assets under management at the time, uh, and we've just broken through $200 billion and carving out all kinds of other new opportunities, by the way. We're actually now doing um, strategic investing or core investing, where we're actually just buying something and hanging on to it, rather than the usual, we sometimes call it the hamster model of PE, where you, ra you run fast to raise a fund, you deploy the fund, and you exit the fund, and, and then you have to run even faster if you want to build it. Well, so we've actually asked, I remember going to Henry Kravis one time and saying, Henry, wow, this is such an extraordinary company. And this is when I still hadn't truly grasped the difference between private equity and public equity. Um, I was an economist, not a finance guy. Uh, and I said, why do we have to sell this company? Henry, this is spectacular. It's printing money. It's better than the US Treasury, the Mint. Um, and he said, well, you know, this is what PE does. And I said, well, gosh, have we ever thought about why we're doing it this way? And lo and behold, we're doing core investing. And we have big co-investors for that. We have strategic partnerships, which is 15-year money and beyond that. So again, there's lots of new opportunities regionally uh, in these themes that I mentioned. And then actually in what it is that we're doing, uh, in some cases pioneering, in some other cases following some others. Uh, in real estate energy infrastructure in addition to the traditional model. And then the huge growth of the credit and capital markets side of the business as well, um, where we're now doing the financing. We are our own biggest investor. Our balance sheet, Sanjay, I don't know if you've seen this, but it's now $18 billion, uh, which is quite extraordinary. That's our own money. That makes us the single biggest investor in every one of our own funds. Um, and again, the prospects for that in the future are quite considerable, and we very much see India as a destination for an increasing amount of what it is that pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and others have provided us to manage for them. 
Well, look, it's great to end on that, uh, on those positive notes and those opportunities. It's been a, a wide-ranging and fascinating discussion. Thank you for your candor and insights. Uh, please join me in showing our appreciation to General David Petraeus.